Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Lieutenant General Bob Shea, U.S. Marine Corps retired, President and Chief Executive Officer of AFSIA International. Well, welcome everyone and uh, thank you for being here. We were off for a great start this morning with the service chiefs and I'm sure everybody's had a, an opportunity to get out there on the floor and if you haven't, we would certainly welcome you and encourage you to do that. There's a lot of great things to see out there, so please uh, make sure you have the opportunity. Um, today we're fortunate to have uh, the Navy Chief Information Officer uh, with us. He's been the Chief Information Officer since for about five, a little over five months right now. Um, and his responsibilities include providing information management, digital data, and cyber strategy uh, for the Department of the Navy. This gentleman is, uh, brings with him a vast experience. Prior to the job he's in right now, he was working in the, uh, at the OSD staff and was a senior advisor to the De uh, Department of Defense CIO. He was working particular pro our programs such as uh, artificial intelligence, the Jake, enterprise cloud, cyber, and command and control communications. So he certainly isn't a stranger to the challenges that are, are faced within the Department of the Navy. Um, I think one of the key points to recognize, though, is he has uh, a broad experience in, tr in transform transformative efforts uh, in many of the jobs he's had prior to coming to the Department of the Navy and the Department of Defense. And uh, he is recognized not only for his IT acumen, but for his ability to strategically think and plan and to develop those transformational processes that are, uh, that are necessary to enhance the warfighting capability and the business processes within the Department of the Navy. While serving in industry, he was consistently placed into positions that required not only technical acumen, but also strong strategic thinking. Now as a Navy CIO, he has a chance to put to good use those, the strategic vision, the ability to think strategically, and provide those leadership skills that he's developed over time um, and it made him a highly successful and widely recognized in the commercial sector as a strong, strong leader. So please join me in welcoming the Department of the Navy CIO, Aaron Weiss. Thank you. Okay, thank you, General. Good afternoon. So as, uh, as was mentioned, I don't have a long period of government service. Um, just about two years now. And I had the opportunity to spend a year and a half or so uh, in DOD CIO uh, before being given the, uh, the opportunity and the privilege to come over to Department of Navy to work with Navy and Marine Corps. It's exciting. Now, I never had an opportunity to serve in the military, uh, but I do have an emotional connection to the Navy. My father was uh, a Navy nuke, and so it's an opportunity to try to come back and, do, and provide some service, and um, I can tell you that my dad is, is pretty proud. If you want to go to the next slide. I had a, uh, a CEO in one of my two CIO stints at the Fortune 500 level. And she used to open every important meeting with a question, what time is it? And she wasn't looking for the time on the clock or what day it was. She was asking, what is the context that we're having this meeting? What's behind the meeting that we are about to have and what questions are we trying to answer? So when I think about now the role here for Department of Navy, I think about what time is it at the Department of Navy? I think there's some important themes. The first one is if you look at the capability that we're providing for sailors and Marines, we're providing a basic level of capability, but we're only providing data, uncontextualized data, 
at the point of the warfighter. And we are asking the warfighter to turn that into usable information. Let me give you an example. Uh, I had the opportunity to spend a weekend underway on board the Eisenhower. It was an incredible experience. Um, and while there, we went down and we watched from where they were fighting the ship. And, you know, at first glance, it's very impressive, right? Big screen, a lot of people, darkened room. Uh, and what do you see up on the screen? You know, there's civilian traffic, and there's the strike group traffic, and there's the red team. There's even the, uh, the Russian sub they're tracking that's out there. Um, you've got meteorological information, right? You've got a number of um, sources of information that appear on that big screen. But the reality is they were just being integrated at the display. Nowhere was all that information coming together and being synthesized and provide context that made it usable information and it was being presented with a set of COAs that could be chosen from. It was certainly put on a screen, but it was up to those sailors who were fighting the ship at that point to make sense of it and decide these are our options. And I think that was a great example of this first item, which is we're not synthesizing information, we're just projecting data. And we need to do a better job of providing that information integration. I think the second element of what time is it is related to our networks. I know that here in the Department of Navy, NMCI is a four-letter word, but the reality is our networks are overly complex, they're topographically challenged, they're extremely difficult to defend, and extremely difficult for our mission forces to maneuver within. Our networks are not our greatest asset. In fact, I would argue that our networks are holding us back. I think the other element of what time it is, is that if you look at the individual experience that we provide to sailors and Marines, it is substandard. I think as a point of context coming in from industry, as a CIO, I was very surprised to see where we were at across the Navy and Marine Corps in terms of that experience. And we are typically providing an experience between our network infrastructure and productivity tools that is about 15 years behind what is provided outside of government. That was a shock. And that experience is a productivity blocker. We're not providing the best experience and the best tools for sailors, Marines, and civilians to get their job done. And in many cases, they're actually working around the tools that are provided to them. And I think the, the last element, and probably the most important, so it maybe shouldn't be at the bottom of the slide, is that the Department of Navy is losing our information every day to our adversaries. We're leaking our information out, whether it's from direct exfiltration or through the defense industrial base, tier two, tier three, in transit. We are not securing the information that we have from the adversary's hands. And that's a powerful statement. And all of those pulled together leave an image of us not providing the capability that we need to provide. So what to do about it? How many people in here, maybe raise your hands, have had an opportunity to read the information vision that was recently released from Department of Navy? Okay, a, a few of you. Kudos to you. For the rest of you, I would encourage you to go take a look at it. If you go to the next slide. That vision lays out an idea of information superiority. In the modern world, 
the world that we're all living in and that we, were, we are fighting in, information is the lifeblood of almost every transaction that happens. In business, your ability to harness that information for competitive advantage is a must in order to win in the marketplace. Here for Department of Navy, our ability to har harvest and harness that information for competitive advantage is critical for our ability to win. And we call that in the vision information superiority. So what is information superiority? Simply said, it is the ability to put the right information in the right hands at the right time for a warfighter to be able to decide and act and do that in an environment where the adversary is denying or degrading our capability. It's information superiority in the same way that we might talk about maritime superiority or air superiority. Our ability to maneuver within that domain, provide information, to operate within the information environment at will. And if you go back to the previous slides of what time it is, we're not positioned to be able to do that. I think it's as simple as that. So I didn't really mean go back, but we can go back. So we'll go forward and again forward. So what are we talking about? Oh, by the way, the key tagline on that, on that slide was that if we can attain information superiority, and we can harness that to win, that is the start of combat power. You need to have information superiority to be able to attain combat power in the modern world. So how do we do that? The vision that was released uh, articulates three high-level lines of effort that we need to undertake as a Department of Navy to bring, to bring about information superiority. The first one is this broad theme of modernization. We need to close the 15-year gap. We need to go out and aggressively tackle the problem of our networks. We need to have a single unified transport layer that's flatter, easier to defend, leverages modern technology like software-defined networking, that we can use to deliver that information anywhere. It shouldn't matter at some point whether you're on a tactical forward network or you're on, a, on an enterprise network or a garrison network. In that modern world, it's seamless. You can get from and to anywhere in that network. Any information to anywhere else as required. The second element of modernization is that we need to aggressively pursue a cloud-based infrastructure. Cloud-based infrastructure is more than just about how you operate and provide compute power. Cloud-based infrastructure will enable you to do things like modern software design that will be able to allow us to streamline processes today that take years down to things that take weeks. The third element of modernization is identity. And we have to modernize how we provide identity to all our sailors, Marines, and civilians. It is amazing to me that in this day and age, we provide multiple identities to a sailor or Marine as they move through their career. I had the CEO of Microsoft in my office a few weeks ago, and we were talking about some of these things. And I described the environment that we live in today, which is we have a sailor who has a shoreside email. He or she gets deployed onto a ship. They get a different email. It takes some time for that to happen. Eventually, they come back into a new role or a new organization. They might get another email address. 
this happens over and over and over again until eventually people are dragging around seven or more identities. How can you have a modern infrastructure that's defendable and securable if we're not even sure who you are? And that whole idea of, of providing identity in that way was flabbergasting to Satya Nadella. He was shocked. We have to modernize how we provide identity. The second broad theme is innovate. So if modernize is just about closing the gap and getting to parity, then innovate is how you move beyond that and create competitive advantage. And innovate is about creating that game-changing capability that will provide us an advantage versus the adversary. And we'll do that through a couple of ways. One is by always harnessing emerging technologies, and today those are things like AI and 5G, et cetera, but there will always be a new emerging technology that we need to track and integrate and create capability from, and we need to be able to do that repetitively. The second critical, way, the second critical theme of innovation is getting to modern software development capability. And what do we mean by that? That means software development that is measured in days or weeks instead of years. Today, if you want to provide a new capability, what do you do? You come up with it as an idea, you float it, it gets palmed for, that takes 22 months, it'll get funded, we'll do a requirements effort, that'll take a year, We'll supply a multi-thousand page of requirements to completely vet it. We'll give it to the acquisition community who will RFP it. That'll take 12 months or more. And in the end, then we'll actually start execution. We might deliver it in another 12 months. And then we go through this process called authority to operate, where we'll then grant you an ATO. That might take a year. So from the moment that you said, hey, we should do that, to the time that we actually field that capability in the world that we live in today could take five to seven years. That is a geological time frame in information management that is never going to work for us. If, you're, uh, if, if you are a Google user of Gmail, how often do they update their Gmail? How often do they update their account? So often you don't even notice. And you expect it to happen. They're pushing that software to you on a regular basis. We have cars now, Teslas, who update their software while it's sitting in the garage overnight. We have engineers who are working that, testing and deploying that software over the air, and they're providing updates as required. That modern software design is a combination of several things. It's actually a combination of what's in the modernized uh, LOE. They have trusted networks that they can rely on to develop on and to push updates. They have a cloud-based infrastructure that gives them the flexibility to develop software in a trusted environment. They trust who they are because they have solid identity. That combination of those things allows them to develop software at speed. Because if you trust the network, you trust the process that you go through to develop software, the libraries that are involved in software development, and the transport involved in pushing it out, it makes a heck of a lot easier to say that I trust the outcome. And if you do that, you can bring that five to seven years down to a matter of weeks. And weeks is a relevant time frame where five to seven years is not. The third broad LOE here is this idea of defend. And you'll note that we're not calling it cyber. I think cyber is a word that has become so used that at this point it probably means everything to everyone. And therefore maybe it's meaningless today. 
It's a buzzword that's used to describe things so that you can get funding, so you can attract attention, so you can make speeches, but it doesn't describe what we're trying to do. And what we need to do is defend our information wherever it is. Whether it's at rest, whether it's in transit, whether it's in the supply chain, the defense industrial base, you name it, we should be defending it in a way we're not today. And I think there's a couple things involved in that defend idea. The first one is we need to move to a state where we are always assessing our ability and our capability to defend in a way that's very different from how we do it today. We need to be continuously assessing our own capability, almost red teaming ourselves on an ongoing basis. Importantly though, we have to adjust our culture for how we think about defending information. Today, we have a culture that is security by compliance. Hey, if you fill out these forms, you fill out this spreadsheet, you submit it into a process, we'll go through that process and in a year or so, we'll give you an authority to operate and then you as the system operator say, hey, I'm secure. Well, maybe you were secure that day that you filled out the spreadsheet, but time moved on, life marched on, the adversary evolved, software changed, you're no longer secure. I had another CEO boss in the chemical industry who used to describe safety as our right to operate. And he said, we earn that right to operate every day. And if we cannot earn that right to operate, we will close ourselves down before we hurt somebody or kill somebody or before the government comes in and shuts us down. That's a right we earn every day. And I think we have to bring that same kind of mentality to defend and to cybersecurity. It has to become a state of readiness that we are earning every day. Um, it has to be something that every person views as part of their job jar, not just somebody in the six or somebody in the IT shop or wherever it is. And I think the words of the CNO recently when he described this was this is commander's business. I think that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of that cultural change. It's not just IT's problem or the IP's problem or whoever it is. It's commander's business, it's everybody's business. I also like the words that uh, Lieutenant General Reynolds used to describe that. And she said, look in the Marine Corps, we say that every Marine is a rifleman Maybe we ought to be saying that every sailor and every Marine is a cyber sentry. It becomes a part of how we operate. We know what to do and what not to do. Importantly, in the, in the, in the uh, third element of defend is that we have to change how we engage with our supply chain, with our defense industrial base. I think today we expect to enforce cybersecurity through requirements and through the acquisition process. And I don't think that's, a, that's not a formula that's working. I think it's a part of it, but it cannot be the end all be all. We as a Department of Navy are gonna have to collaborate with and lean in together with those mature tier one suppliers to go work together to figure out how to go fill in the gaps that exist in the tier two and tier three of our supply chain. Because that's where the weakness is. You know, people, the exfiltration is not necessarily happening at the tier ones, at the Raytheons and Lockheeds of the world. It's happening at, you know, Joe's Hinge Company making pieces for uh, aileron on an F-35 in Fort Wayne, Indiana who doesn't have the maturity from a defend perspective to be able to uh, defend themselves. And we have to work together on how to do that. Want to go to the next slide? So this is just a fancier way to show what I just talked to you about. 
And when you do download and take a look at that information vision, um, you'll see that it is only by bringing all these elements together that we're going to be able to change the outcome. And this is where it's really important that we do this. We are at a critical inflection point. It's hard to see where we can allow ourselves to slip further behind. It's hard to see how we can do that and sustain a path towards being able to support the CNOs and the Commandant's vision around maritime superiority. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to modernize, drive innovation with abandon, and be able to defend our information. This is table stakes before we can talk about all the other great stuff that we want to be able to do. And I'm just going to add a little bit because it's the topic du jour that we're going to have to do this in the context of what today is a budget environment where we're looking at essentially a flat top line budget environment. And I have fielded a number of questions from people who say, well, how can you do that? How can you talk about modernize, innovate, defend, and all the stuff that you have to do, that we have to do, and then on the other side of the coin, you're gonna talk about the fact that we're gonna support the stem to stern effort, that we're gonna go do what we need to do per the Secretary of the Navy's directive to go help solve the 355 ship problem. How can you talk about that? Well, I think that we're talking about complementary problems. We spend in the president's budget, 21, what will likely be, uh, just a little bit more than $11 billion a year on IT. And that is not including gray IT, shadow IT, uh, and that's not including weapons platform IT. If you think about $11 billion, that's a little bit more than, that's about 5.5% of our top line. The top line across the Navy and Marine Corps for the Department of Navy level is about $200 billion. And we're spending not quite 6% of our top line on IT. $11 billion is a lot of money. So but how does that compare with what other people spend? Well, I can tell you that coming from uh, a chemical and a high-tech manufacturing industry, that number, which every CEO will ask their CIO, what's our IT spend as a percentage of revenue? What is your spend as a percentage of your top line? In the automotive and high-tech manufacturing world, that number is usually somewhere around 1.6% of revenue. If you're in one of the critical foundational financial services industries, that number would be higher because different industries have different uh, ratios. One of the highest is the financial services industry. That number would typically be about 6% of the top line. That's probably, then that's somebody like a JP Morgan or a Bank of America providing world-class capability on systems and networks that will transact, if you're JP Morgan, 20% or so of the national economy every day over their networks. And you better believe that adversaries are knocking on their door every day. Who wouldn't want to put a broomstick in the spokes of the US economy on any given day? And they're doing that at 6%. So I would argue this is not a problem of us not spending at a world-class level, I would say the problem is that we're not providing capability at a world-class level. And that's the challenge. And I think that's what we're gonna have to face as we go through this modernize, innovate, defend vision. How do we spend the world-class spend that we have today and do that smartly so that we get world-class capability out of that level of resourcing. And that's a different set of challenges than somebody saying, well, we just need to increase our spend. Because I think as we've heard 
through comments that have been made that that's not a world that we're necessarily living in right now. So we're going to have to navigate that. But I'm pretty confident that we're going to be able to do that. So I encourage everyone to take a look at the vision and the strategy. Uh, there's going to be a lot more activity around this. If there's anything that I want you to take away from today's talk, it is just those three words and the incredible importance of getting after modernization, driving innovation, and being able to defend our information. I'd like to thank FCIA for uh, inviting me here to do this. I'd also like to uh, thank the team that I uh, have the privilege of working with at the Navy and Marine Corps uh, who uh, are going to help drive us to this place in the future. It's a long way to go, but it is really important that we do it. I don't, I'm not sure that we're going to get this chance again, this bite at the apple again, in the next cycle of a couple years. We're at a unique place. We have a commandant and a CNO who uniquely understand the value of the information environment. We have a DOD CIO as our sponsor at OSD who uniquely understands the importance of this. We have a Secretary of the Navy who also very much understands the importance of this. So we have sort of a time and place where we can make this happen. And it's going to be up to us to do that. So I'm looking forward to it. Nothing could be more important and nothing could be more energizing. So with that, I'd like to thank you for, uh, for listening and uh, possibly open it up for any questions that you may have. Good afternoon, sir. Kurt Warden. Nova Power Solutions, a uh, woman-owned small business, tier two supplier. My question is on the defend piece. Uh, the department is putting a uh, significant effort into securing the defense industrial base, or at least providing the guidance to do that. Uh, and with the cyber uh, security maturity model coming out, there's some effort to put some structure in that. Uh, my question really resolves around uh, the identification uh, and marking for controlled unclassified information. Uh, as you're aware, CFR uh, 32 uh, part uh, 2002 is, is that section that covers it. Uh, DOD 5200 series covers it for the department. Those two uh, pieces of one's law, one's policy, uh, don't align. Uh, so my question is, is the department making efforts to align those, and what efforts is the department taking to ensure that its people are trained in uh, the procedures for CUI and identifying them and handling them properly? It's a great question. Um, I think the CUI activity is something that we are driving under the, it does fall under the defend LOE. Uh, and it is an activity that we're working on with the uh, information security officers. I think the key is can we put in place the right policy that helps clarify that for you. But I, I want to go back to one of the things that you mentioned, which is the CMMC. And um, that has been a topic of conversation. And I think the CMMC is an activity that uh, I, I strongly support. Um, I think Katie Arrington out of OSD a &S has done a very good job to bring that to life in a very short amount of time. Um, and it is a model that uh, has been leveraged elsewhere. It's based on that self-certification model, which is used successfully, um, say, in the ISO 9000 world or the automotive TS 96149 world. That's, that's a model that can work. It will take some time before it's something that um, I think is embedded in how we operate here, but I, I fully support what she's trying to do to get that model out the door. But thank you for your question. Thanks. Good afternoon, sir. Lieutenant Commander Trey Collish, Knowledge Management Officer at Expeditionary Warfare Training, Gra Training Group Pacific. One of the challenges with the strategic approach that we have, that you'll see a common thread through all of them, is people. If you're going to be able to modernize, innovate, and defend, you have to have talent. 
And my understanding is that we have a hard time attracting and retaining talent. What with Microsoft and Google and the millions of dollars they can throw at those people. And not only that, the innovative ways that they allow them to use their talents. I was wondering if you could comment on that, let us hear your perspective, and perhaps what we're doing about it. So it's a great question. Um, you're 100% right that talent and having a workforce who can sustain those three ideas is the key to success. But in that, I would suggest that we're probably no different than anyone else. There's a room full of really smart people who sits around at Amazon and tries to figure out how they can go get more smart people or how they can keep their smart people. I think we're challenged by the same thing. The thing that, that an Amazon or a Microsoft or whoever that they have is they can offer technologists the promise to work with the coolest, newest technology, and they can throw a fairly good-sized paycheck at that person. Um, right now, we can't do either one of those things. I think we can get to the point where, we're, where we can throw the opportunity to do the coolest technology, but the thing that we have that no technology company or Google or anyone else is ever gonna have is we have the most awesome mission that anyone could ask for. So what we have is the most important thing that a person could be doing, and I think we've gotta exercise that. But to go back to your question of how do we train and keep them, I think there is a real opportunity for us to improve that, and there, was a, there is a workforce element to this that I didn't talk about. Um, and what we're going to have to do is understand how can we nurture a technology track for our ITs, IPs, and others where that we can develop them and show them a career path um, around how we leverage information. Uh, that's incumbent on us to do that and to work with MNRA, the chief learning officer, and others to understand how we can integrate that into the development uh, and the career track of our, uh, of our officers and enlisted men and women. I think that's, that's an open point, uh, and that is uh, absolutely a part of that. And uh, when you download the vision document, you'll see what we wrote about it in terms of that. I'll read it right away. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Steve Moffitt, uh, VT3 training officer at flight training uh, outside of Pensacola. Uh, first of all, I want to appreciate the push to modernization. I think uh, I've accumulated only about four emails in my career, so I'm maybe on the lower end of that, but I do appreciate that. Uh, my questions are also in the same vein with people. I think uh, one of the biggest threats we continue to have, or any industry continues to have with IT, is uh, the end user, the information hygiene um, that the, on the tactical side people exercise. I think a lot of the biggest breaches that we continue to have seem to come out of that, those, uh, those, that tactical level. Uh, and as a training officer now, one of the things I have to do is, is track the, the training that we do for like cyber awareness. You know, at the tactical level, again, what do we do to, to train people, to educate people about why this stuff is important? Uh, and I'm not, I guess, in 12 or 13 years of doing the cyber awareness training every year, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced that that really gets people um, where they need to be with that. So is there any thought or any... Uh, way forward to get people to really care about this. You talked about making every sailor marine a, a cyber warrior. I think that's important, uh, but I, on the tactical side, I have a hard time uh, like seeing that come to fruition. So is there anything that we can do to, to make that kind of few, few steps forward in that direction? Yeah, well, I'm with you. I'm, I've never gained uh, any personal enlightenment through web-based training, right? I mean, we all have to do that. Uh, it's hard to argue that that's making us uh, more secure, but it is something we're doing. Um, I think, um, ha again, if I go back to how that cyber mindset, that defend mindset, gets integrated into everything that we do from a training and development perspective, that's where you get at that, because it's a cultural problem, not as much of a, did I develop awesome you know, web-based training? Uh, and did we track it with a database, right? This gets back to have we given people um, points in their career where they have been able to integrate that cybersecurity training into their career 
where it's become a part of how they had to operate. Um, you know, where they maybe learned at some point, what are the 11 general orders of a cyber sentry versus you know, being assigned web-based training that they have to go get. But I think what you're getting at is sort of the leading edge of that cultural change that we have to make. Yeah. Tara, thank you. All right. Thanks, sir. I'm sorry, if you could come up uh, after you can speak to uh, Mr. Weiss and do that, please. <clears throat> Again, uh, what a great opportunity. We get to hear, hear it from the Don CIO. I think we, we got the message, it was pretty strong. We talked about uh, a unified network, pursuit of cloud modernization, innovation, and defend. And there are certainly a lot of challenges out there. Um, and I know that uh, this audience is prepared to help you work through those challenges, sir. So uh, on behalf of the United States Naval Institute and I'd like to, in the FC, I'd like to present you with a copy of, uh, with our gratitude, a copy of the Chinese Communist Espionage and Intelligence Primer by Peter Mattis and Matthew Brazil, and inside you'll find an AFSTIA uh, bookmark. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.